So let's start our biostats here. So first we're gonna talk about the different types of research studies that we can be asked about. Uh, first is our meta-analysis. Now, a meta-analysis study is really just, it's not a true study. So a meta-analysis doesn't go out and, and do research itself. Really, a meta-analysis takes a bunch of research that's been done already and takes a bunch of different studies, puts all of their data together in order to try and discover things that may not have been discoverable via those studies. For example, if if I do a study and I get a group of 10 people and I discover that uh, seven of them have foot fungus, okay? Well, seven out of 10, it, it's not really a big enough group to say that seven out of 10 people in the country have foot fungus, right? That just happens to be the 10 people that I found. Um, so my, my p-value would not be significant, right? I could not get a good power. I wouldn't get a good p-value. Um, and, uh, and for that reason, my study wouldn't be that great. Now, if I submit my study gets published and then about 15 to 20 other people in the country do a similar study with similar small groups of people, someone can go about and do a meta-analysis where all of these studies are taken, all of these uh, data are extracted from our papers and put together into a giant data analysis and they will find, well, it looks like, yes, it is true that seven out of 10 people uh, have foot fungus because now we have a, a subject group of over, you know, a thousand people because we were able to take all of the data from these different studies. Okay. Now there are limitations of meta-analysis. For example, uh, the way that I did my study was I went out and I looked at people's feet. If I thought I saw foot fungus, I said, okay, this person has foot fungus. Another person across the country can be doing the study, but instead of just looking at the feet, they're taking a sample of the skin. They swab the skin and then they try and grow fungus. If fungus grows, then they call that a confirmatory for foot fungus, okay? Now, which one of those would be more accurate? Just looking at a foot and seeing foot fungus or actually growing foot fungus? Growing it would be more, more accurate, right? That would be a better quality of the study. However, when I did my meta-analysis, I took every single type of study. So people that just looked at the feet and saw foot fungus were compared directly with people that were actually doing real um, you know, cultures. And so those two are not equivalent. And so when you talk about the quality or bias of studies, that can put some limitations on the quality of your meta-analysis. Maybe, so you found that 70% that, uh, of people have foot fungus. However, the studies that you use to prove that we're not all equivalent in their value, okay? And so uh, what we can say here, if we're asked on step one, typically they like to ask, what is one of the limitations of a study such as this one? What we would say is that uh, the quality would be less than doing a, a direct uh, observational study, okay? Great, so um, when, uh, talking about these different types of research studies, we want to know two things. Number one, what does it consist of? How would you describe this type of study? That's the first thing you need to know. What's sort of the benefit of this study? And number two, what's the drawback of the study? That they're gonna ask about these things and you wanna be ready. What are some of the cons of doing a study in this way? Okay, so for meta-analysis, we're able to get a greater power because we have a greater subject pool and more data. However, it's limited by the quality of the studies in the meta-analysis and the bias that may be there as well. Okay, kind of one of those you got to take it with a grain of salt type situations. Great. Next is our clinical trials. Here we're comparing two groups in which one variable is manipulated and its effects measured. Clinical trials are an excellent type of study because here we are really controlling all of the different uh, variables. Okay, clinical trials are really one of the best types of research, the best quality of research. That would be the pro is that um, because we're controlling for so many variables, we're really able to, to, um, to measure effects accurately. Now, what's the con with doing a, a clinical trial? Well, clinical trials take a quite a long time. Uh, because we're going to start at day one and then look at the effects moving forward, we need to have all of that time to complete that trial. In the U.S., you know, clinical trials, they have to go through several levels. There's four levels that we'll talk about um, that clinical trials move through before a drug gets approved. 
And so, you know, for those reasons, clinical trials take quite a long time and they're difficult to um, orchestrate. Okay, they just take a lot more hands to actually put a clinical trial on. Okay. Next is our cohort type of study. Here we compare a group with a risk factor to a group without, and we ask what will happen. Cohorts are prospective. If we do a cohort study, that means we're gonna start on day one, and we're gonna have a group of people that have exposure to a risk factor, and a group of people without the exposure to the risk factor, and then we're gonna follow those people through time, okay? We're starting from day one, we have our two groups and we follow them through time. The beautiful thing here is that we can prove cause and effect. Um, that's the idea behind cohort studies, is to prove cause and effect. Um, uh, when we're doing our calculations for cohorts, we're able to use something called the relative risk, which is an equation that we will go over together and uh, look at what, what values we need to calculate relative risk. But you can, you can only calculate relative risk if you're doing a prospective study. Meaning, next we're going to talk about retrospective studies where we're looking at the past. When you look at the past, you cannot prove cause-effect. So you cannot use a relative risk um, calculation. Okay. So in terms of what you need to know for cohort, number one, know that you can calculate relative risk using cohort, which is good. This is a stronger type of equation, a more meaningful type of equation. If you say that the relative risk of something is X number, that means more than saying the odds of something happening is Y. Okay. Relative risk is a more meaningful number. Okay, great. Uh, that's the first thing you need to know for cohort. It's going to be relative risk equation. Second, it's going to be prospective, meaning going into the future. We're going to start on day one and then go into the future for a certain period of time and then look at the causes and effects after that, uh, which go brings us to our number three, that cohort studies prove cause and effect. Okay, great. Next is our case control studies. Here we're comparing a group with a certain disease to a group without the disease. And then we say, what happened? Okay, so here we can look at risk factors. We have a group of people who have, uh, who have a certain type of cancer, right? We'll say that they have a certain type of skin cancer. And we have a, another group of people that do not have skin cancer. What we're going to do is we're going to look at their charts. We're going to ask them a questionnaire. We're going to figure out what were your exposures? Um, what was your access to healthcare? What things happened to bring us to this day? Okay, so with case control studies, we're looking retrospectively, we're looking into the past. These are very easy studies to do, right? If you have access to an electronic medical record, you can really just take a group of patients that have a disease and then look at their charts and say, oh, this, this group of people have a disease and they're all exposed to, to um, you know, this certain type of UV radiation. And then this group of people never go out in the sun and then they don't get the skin cancer. And so they're very easy studies to do. That's sort of the benefit there. The limitation is that when you're looking into the past, you cannot prove causation. Okay, we can look at correlations, we can look at the odds ratio which is another type of calculation we can do, but we cannot say this led to this. You really cannot even say this increases your risk of this, okay? Because relative risk is part of cohort, which is prospective. For case control studies, we're looking into the past and we're going to calculate an odds ratio. If you went out into the sun, you have an odds, you know, twice, twice the odds of developing this certain type of skin cancer but they're just odds, right? They're, this is not a direct risk of developing skin cancer. It's not, it's not as good of a study, okay? Uh, case series here uh, is really just a set of cases, um, typically six to, to 20 cases that you describe within a paper. Um, you know, this is done for rare diseases or new ways of treating rare diseases. What we do is we really in detail describe a clinical presentation of a disease and uh, we'll do that for several different patients, okay? And so you can see how this research study is definitely not as strong or as of good quality as something like a cohort study where we're starting from day one, 
taking two groups of people and then moving forward, right? That That is going to be a big study, lots of patients versus case series, usually just a few patients that we follow over time, okay? All right, the last is going to be our cross-sectional. When you think cross-sectional, I want you to think about chopping right now in time. We're gonna take this second of this minute of this day and we're going to say right now at this second, what is going to be our disease prevalence? Um, what is going to be, uh, you know, any, any factor that you're looking for, you're looking at it right now. You're not following over time to see development. You're just looking at if we took a cross-sectional and we, we looked at everyone right now, what would we see? It's a snapshot in time, okay? And so, uh, you know, again, the data here, it may give you a clue into something that's going on, but it's not a strong, it's not a strong research study like something like a clinical trial. Okay. And so as you move, if you, as you move sort of down this with the exception of meta-analysis, starting with clinical trials, this is going to be your strongest type of study. Second would be a cohort study. Third is case control. Fourth and fifth, uh, case series and cross-sectional. These are both kind of t tied for fourth in terms of their value, um, of, of research studies. Okay. All right, great. And so this kind of, uh, sums up what uh, type of studies you can be asked about. Uh, typically what will happen is on step one, you will be given a, a research study to read. Uh, it'll be typically be you know about a page, you'll see the abstract uh, methods, um, you know, results, discussion, they'll give you all the parts of a research study. And then after that, they're going to give you a set of four or five questions about the study that you just read. And so, one of the questions is going to be, what type of study was this? And so you need to be familiar with these definitions um, and you know, be able to choose what study it was. Know the definitions to a point where if the answer, instead of having answer choices of A, clinical trial, B, cohort, C, case control, the answer choices could be A, a study which compares two groups, da 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 da, B, a comparison of groups Right? So instead of having the name of these research studies as your answer choices, you may have a description of what these research studies are as your answer choices. So be very comfortable with these definitions and, um, and you, know, you shouldn't have any trouble with that type of question. Okay? Great. So in terms of our clinical trials, um, drug trials go through four phases. Uh, this is a chart that is taken from our first aid for step one book. Uh, and so we're just going to go through these phases quickly and talk about what each entails. Our phase one, uh, you know, obviously it's the first phase. This is the first thing you do in your research study to prove that a drug is safe. Uh, during phase one, you take a small number of people, healthy people, not people with the disease you're looking for. Um, uh, instead, you're looking for, in a healthy person, would this be safe? So we look for the toxicity, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, how does this break down in the person's bloodstream? These are the questions that we're trying to have answered in our phase one. But again, small number of people um, without the disease of interest, just healthy people. In phase two, now we're still going to work with a small number of people in case there's, you know, very adverse side effects. We want to not give it to a large group of people to start off, right? So we start with a small number of people of the of small number of patients with that disease of interest, and we're going to measure does this drug actually work? Maybe we already proved it in rats or monkeys or or some other animal. We need to prove it in humans now. So we're going to take people with that disease. We're going to give them the drug and assess how strong the drug is, what's the best dosing, any adverse effects. That is the goal of phase two. All right. Now, in phase three is when we're moving into large number of patients. This is like really the last phase before your drug goes to market. Okay. And so here, what we're really trying to figure out is, is this drug as good or better as what's out there? So say we made up a new drug for hypertension. Is this drug going to be better than my lisinopril? Okay, so we are going to take a large number of patients, assign them either to our drug group, it's called Evapril. Okay, we're going to assign patients either to Evapril group or lisinopril group, and we're going to measure 
what is the patient's blood pressures after six months, okay? We already know this drug is safe. We know it works. We know what dose we need to give because we did all that stuff in phase one and phase two. Now we're looking at how efficacious is it? How good is the drug, okay? Uh, if it is shown to be better than um, the current standard of care, now we can actually go to market with this with this drug, okay? So in phase four, this phase is actually just from the day that the drug is released into the market until the drug ultimately stops being used on the market, okay? Phase four never really ends until the drug stops being used, okay? Remember that. Phase four, you know, when you talk about these phases, it's, it, you know, you think like, okay, after phase four, maybe that's when we're done. We're never really done, okay? When it comes to these phases of clinical trials, phase four is just until eternity, we're surveilling patients after the treatment is, is approved. Uh, can it stay? We're detecting rare or long-term ad adverse effects. Evapril was shown to be 10 times better than lisinopril, and so we released it onto the market. But it turns out if you take Evapril for uh, 10 years, you end up with foot fungus. Okay, so that's a problem, and we need to be aware of that. Um, and so phase four, just think of that as the drug surveillance, we're making sure that there's no long-term side effects that um, that can happen down the line. Okay, great. You, you, will, you will have a question on clinical trials on your step one exam. I guarantee it. Um, so be comfortable with uh, phase one. Just think about one healthy person, right? Phase one is one healthy person. Phase two is two sick people, okay? Phase three is a lot of sick people. Phase four is all the sick people, okay? Um, and then that's how you can kind of remember that, okay? Any questions on clinical trials? Okay, pretty straightforward. Great, now we can start talking about some of our math, some of our equations, some of our fun sensitivity and specificity. This says specificity, I should say specificity. I'll have to get on my person who makes these slides um, making typos, not good. Sensitivity, the goal of sensitivity is to rule out. Drug, um, tests with a high sensitivity are great because we can give them to a large number of people and we know that a positive is probably positive, okay? So proportion of people with disease who test positive, okay? So we're gonna take all of our true positives and divide that by our true positives plus our false negatives, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, so the way that we typically, or the way that what I did on step one, every time I had a question on specificity and sensitivity, I always, always drew the chart. I always drew the chart, okay? And so what I would put on top, I would put disease on top, okay? And so this is disease positive and disease negative. And then I would put test on the Y. This is for my test. And this is test positive and test negative, okay? So... If someone is disease positive and tests positive, we call that a true positive, right? Whatever our test said is accurate, okay? Now, if our, we have a patient with who does not have a disease, they're disease negative, and the test says that they don't have the disease, that's a true negative, okay, great. So if our patient has the disease, our test is negative, that is a false negative. Why? Because our patient has the disease, but the test says they don't. So that's a false negative, we don't like that. Um, if our patient does not have disease and the test says they, do, says they do, that would be a false positive, okay? Very straightforward, makes sense. As you do these questions for sensitivity and specificity, always draw the chart, always draw the chart and plug in the numbers and when you plug in the numbers, even go into the top corner and put TP right there, so you remember, TP is here, put FP there, and always draw the chart the same way so that uh, you don't uh, accidentally flip where the numbers are supposed to be. Getting back into our sensitivity. So if we take all the people that have a true positive, and then we take the people who had a false negative and add that to the number of true positive, um, then that will give us the, um, the gross denominator of um, our sensitivity. So our sensitivity is gonna be true positive over true positive plus false negative. And think about it, we want a test that is going to give us 
um, all of the people that have the disease. We don't want people with the disease to be left out. We don't want people with false negatives. If someone has the disease and the test is negative, that's not good. That's not a good screening test. That means that when we go out there and we test for, say, tuberculosis, that some of the people that are coming back negative actually have tuberculosis. That is not a good screening test, okay? A good screening test would have 100% true positive, 0% false negative, and this equation would be equal to 1, okay? Because we would have 100 over 100, Okay, um, so that one is also equal to 100%, right? Because 100% of the people who take the test, if they have the disease, it shows up on the test. Okay, so that is the disease, uh, that is the uh, idea behind sensitivity. Okay, now, specificity is more of a confirmatory test. So this is the proportion of people without the disease who test negative. Okay, so here we're taking our true negatives divided by our true negative plus our false positive. So we want to confirm that, um, that a patient that tested positive actually is positive. And so what we need is a test that has very good specificity and that all of the numbers that pop up are true negatives. Okay, so, um, if 100% all of the positive tests are true positive, okay? So uh, a test that's very good at detecting our true negatives, that means that if the test is positive, it truly is a positive, right? Because if it was negative, we know, we can trust that this test, if we give a patient this test and it comes up negative, we can trust that because it has a high specificity, okay? And so the way that our algorithm works is we screen people with a test with high sensitivity, high number of true positives, low number of false negatives. Those people that test positive in a test with high sensitivity, we're gonna give a second test. We're gonna say, okay, we're pretty sure that these people all have the disease. But to confirm it, we're going to give a test with high specificity because our high specificity test, um, we can trust the true negatives there. We're gonna, we give them the test with high specificity the test is positive, we can trust that this patient definitely has the disease because we know that our high specificity test always detects the true negatives, okay? Okay, so uh, this is the way that you need to think about these two tests is that for our true positives, a high sensitivity means that a positive is definitely a positive, okay? High specificity test means that a negative is definitely a negative. Okay. All right. So questions on this so far. Does the, does the concept kind of work here? Why we want each type of test? Yes. This is uh this can be a, a tricky, a tricky thing. Um, you know, concept wise, but I think really just knowing that sensitivity is all about the true positives, specificity is all about the true negatives, will really help you answer these questions, okay? So, uh, also, you must memorize these equations. Um, true positive is true positive plus, uh, true positive over true positive plus false negative equals your sensitivity. True negative over true negative plus false positive is your specificity. You have to memorize this, you have to know it, okay? Positive predictive value is the proportion of positive tests that are true positives. Um, and so here we take true positive and put that over true positive plus false positive. And so uh, this is going to be dependent on the disease prevalence. Um, if the disease prevalence is low, our positive predictive value is low. Okay. So, uh, you know, sensitivity. Um, yes, we have a positive here. Yes, it's, it's a great, has really great sensitivity. But can we trust this positive? Well, let's look at the positive predictive value in this area and we'll know whether or not we can really trust that positive result of our test, okay? And so in terms of calculating, you just wanna take the first two numbers in your chart. True positive and false positive are gonna be involved there. Negative predictive value is the proportion of negative tests that are true negative. Uh, and so 
This is also going to be dependent on prevalence, uh, but in general, higher specificity gives you a higher positive predictive value. Higher sensitivity gives you a higher negative predictive value. Okay, that's generally speaking. But again, these two are going to be dependent on the disease prevalence. These two are not dependent on disease prevalence. Okay, all of these things I'm emphasizing for you are important and are questions on your exam. So sensitivity, specificity have nothing to do with disease prevalence. Never think that they do. The question is gonna try and convince you. I've seen you world questions that do this. They try and convince you, try and make you think that sensitivity and specificity are affected by the disease prevalence in the area that you're testing. They are not. The only things that are, are PPV, which will go up when there's high disease prevalence, um, and NPV, which goes down when there's high, high disease prevalence and, and up when there's low disease prevalence, okay? Any questions on sensitivity specificity? Or we can do some practice. Mm hmm. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yes. So you're talking about for PPV and MPV, correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's the tricky thing. Um, the, re the way that I like to think about it is that, um, you know, if say you're, so let's take two towns, right? Um, or even better, we'll take two boroughs of New York City. So there's the Bronx and there's Brooklyn, okay? And so in the Bronx, there's a large prevalence of foot fungus, Okay, 70% of people in the Bronx have foot fungus. However, in Brooklyn, we have only 10% of people have foot fungus. Okay, now we have this great test for foot fungus. Okay, it has a sensitivity of about 90% and it has a specificity of about 90%. That's a pretty good test. That's a pretty good test, right? We're catching all the true positives um, and we're catching all the true negatives pretty reliably. Now, if we go to the Bronx and we give this test, we're going to be catching 90% of the people with foot fungus, right? There's going to be some 10% that have foot fungus and we're not catching them, right? Because they're false negatives. Um, but we're catching 90% and uh, we can trust that 90% because a lot of people there have foot fungus, right? So we're, we're catching these 90% and we're saying, you know what? So many people here have foot fungus that... Uh, probably this number is even higher, right? There's a good positive predictive value that if you go to an area where a lot of people have foot fungus and you get a positive, it's probably really a positive, okay? Those, those false negatives are not really sticking out too much because we have so much foot fungus. Now, let's go down to Brooklyn. In Brooklyn, only 10% of people have foot fungus. So the chances of you getting a positive are not very high, right? Most people do not have foot fungus there. And so, you know, the chances of you getting a positive are not that high. So when you do get a positive, uh, it's not as good of a value because not many people there have foot fungus. The, there's a higher chance that you're catching people that don't actually have foot fungus, right? You're getting a false positive there, okay? And so um, depending on the area that you're in, it's going to affect the positive predictive value. If you're in an area with a lot of people with a certain disease, the test is very, very good. It's a very, the positive predictive value is good. You can trust it. However, if you go to an area that doesn't have many of that disease, then the positive predictive value is low, okay? So let's swap that around. For negative predictive value, if you go to an area where there's tons of foot fungus and you're getting a lot of negatives, um, that means that your negative predictive value will be low. A lot of people have the disease. So if you get a negative, you can't really trust it. It's like, I feel like everyone here has foot fungus. Why am I getting negatives? So the negative predictive value is low. However, if you go to an area like Brooklyn, not much foot fungus there, uh, and you're getting negatives, you can trust that. Not many people have foot fungus, and so you shouldn't be seeing a lot of positives in an area where people don't have foot fungus, okay? Does that kind of help in um, why they're opposites? I feel like I've said foot fungus more this morning than I have in my entire life, but um, uh, you know, you gotta watch out for that stuff. It's itchy, okay? Great.
So let's move forward. Um, this is where we can sort of describe the meaning of our true positives and true negatives. So here we have people, this, this line here is people who are healthy. This line here is people who have a disease, okay? This dotted line represents the cutoff for a test, okay? Great, so let's, let's make up a marker, okay? It's gonna be called the FF1 marker, okay? Foot fungus one marker. And if we take a blood sample for this foot fungus one marker, it will tell us whether or not someone has foot fungus. That's the test that we made. It's called the FF1 test, okay? We take a little bit of blood from our patient and we run this FF1 test. And if we see that, that particular marker, then we can say that they have foot fungus, okay? Now, here is zero FF1 in the blood. Here is 100 FF1 in the blood. Here's, we, and we can choose a cutoff anywhere in between to catch people. So here is a cutoff of about 50. Okay, now, you can see that, um, you know, we all live sort of on this bell curve where there are people that do not have foot fungus, right? So here's all our non-foot fungus people that will test positive for foot fungus if we give this test, right? So if you look under the curve here, all of these people are going to be testing positive for foot fungus, but I told you that they're healthy, so they don't have foot fungus. They just happen to have this marker in their blood, okay? So what would we call this group of people? Using the, the vocabulary from this chart, which of the, where would you put them on this chart? <laughs> False positive. Excellent. Yes. So they, because we have this cutoff of 50, they're going to be, they're going to test positive for foot fungus, but they're healthy. They do not have foot fungus. So these are going to be our false positives. Excellent. Now, some of our people with foot fungus are going to test negative uh, with our FFP marker, right? So those would be our false negatives. All right, great. And then everyone else is sort of going to, obviously, you know, it's going to be a true positive if they have that FFP marker um, and then true negative if they do not have that marker and they do not have foot fungus. Okay, now, the question that you're going to be asked on your step one exam is what happens when we take this 50 and we say, you know what, we're catching too many people that do not have foot fungus. Um, we're catching them with positive results. I really only wanna have people that truly have foot fungus in my results. I don't want any false positives. So what we would do is we would move this marker this way, okay? And so, now at this point, if we move the marker downwards and we said, instead we're gonna test at 40. Okay, so now what is this gonna do to our numbers? So, uh, number one, the number of false negatives that we see is going to be much further down, right? Because uh, if you test negative now, there is no one with foot fungus on this side of the chart, right? And this on this side of the cutoff. So our false negatives will decrease. Uh, the number of positives however, is going to increase. Why? Look at all these people now that don't have foot fungus that are getting captured uh, with positive tests, okay? And so our false positives are going to increase. Great. So what happens to our true positives? Well, now that we are catching everyone with foot fungus, our true positives will increase. Um, and we're catching some of those people that don't have foot fungus, so our true negatives are going to decrease. Okay, and so what you're going to be asked on step one is if we decreased the cutoff for a certain test, what's going to happen to our specificity? What's going to happen to our sensitivity? Okay, so um, please tell me, Eva, help me here. Sensitivity is equal to what? True positives over...
So our sensitivity is true positive over what? Yes. Good. Good. Okay. So plus false negative. So if we dropped the cutoff for this test, we went from 50 to 40. What happens to our sensitivity? Does it go up or go down? Sure. So we said we dropped our cutoff from 50 to 40 for this particular marker. So what is going to happen to our sensitivity after we do that? When we try and use this test, what happens? Well, our sensitivity is not going to be affected by our false positives, right? Sensitivity is just our true positives plus uh, true positive uh, plus false negative. So here, because because we're catching more people with the disease, our true positive would increase. Uh, and that's going to increase on the denominator as well. Our false negatives are going to decrease, right? Because everyone that has the disease is being captured at this point. Okay, so our false negative would drop. And overall, we would have an increase in our sensitivity. Okay, we have caught every single person that has foot fungus, we've caught them in this test. Unfortunately, we've caught a lot of people that don't have foot fungus. Okay. And so sort of uh, piggybacking on that, what would happen to our specificity? In this case, when we decrease the cutoff for that particular marker, what happens to the specificity? Yes, absolutely. So true negative over true negative plus. Excellent. Okay. So we decreased our, our marker here. So now we are catching some of those people that don't have foot fungus. Those people are coming up as positives, right? Right. False positives increasing. Great. And what about our true negatives? So our, our true negatives, before we decrease this marker, we had all of these, uh, let me change my color so you can see um, the area that I'm referring to. We had all of these people in here were all true negatives before, right? But now they're all gone. Those, are, those people have gone into false positive. Excellent. So the number of true negatives we have has gone down as well. Okay, so overall, what is going to happen to our specificity? It's going to drop. Very good. Very good. Excellent. Okay, so this is the type of question that you are going to get on step one. You will have at least one, even two or three questions that ask you this exact idea. When we change where a tumor marker is or where any kind of marker is, what is going to happen? Okay. So if we went in the other direction, so your options here, Eva, is to either memorize this or to understand it. Yes. Good. Yes. Excellent. I am the same way, um, I, especially with things in biostats. I need to understand it. Otherwise, I'm going to put numbers in the wrong places. I'm going to be all over the place. Okay. And so I'm going to increase my tumor marker now, or not my tumor marker, but my fungus marker from 50 to 60. Okay. Now, I'd like you to kind of walk me through what's going to happen now. Mm -hmm. Right, these are healthy. Good. So, yep, go ahead. Great. Good, excellent, yes. Well said. Ha, ha, ha.
Excellent. Yes, our false negatives will increase. Okay, what else is going to happen? Good. So we are catching everyone that doesn't have the fungus, right? We can confidently say that a person who doesn't have fungus is going to test negative, right? So that's a true negative. So that is going to increase. We went from capturing everything but that, but this little chunk. We were catching everyone but this chunk before, but now we're adding that chunk in as well. So the true negatives are going to increase, okay? What about our true positives? <laughs> yes, right, because we have lost, we have lost all these guys, all these bad boys. These guys are just, you know, crawling with foot fungus, but they're testing negative, okay? So our true positives is going down. How about our false negatives? Is it possible to have a false negative now? False negative, what's happening to our false? So true positive went down. I'm sorry, false positive. I meant to say false positive. False positive. Decrease, great, very good, good. It is. <laughs> yep, they. I, I believe it. It's already harder, and this is my native language. I can tell you that, um, you know, these words really do run together and they really do become tricky, okay? Um, so excellent, you did, an, you did a really good job describing to me what happens in this chart. So now please tell me what happens to sensitivity. Now that we've labeled our chart, we can apply those labels to our equation. What's gonna happen to sensitivity? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Wonderful. Good. And so what happens to our sensitivity? Drop. Yep, very good. Okay. Good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good. Going up. Yes. Very good. So the number that you're dividing by is getting smaller. So, yeah. Yeah, very good, very good. Excellent, so. <laughs> I know I would love to have a way for you to write uh, as well uh, on this with me. I think that would be really the best thing, something I'm gonna figure out for future classes. Um, so excellent, yeah, so this is, this is definitely going to be a question, uh, and yes, practice it. Um, do the same thing that I just went through with you. Move the cutoff, move the cutoff, and ask yourself what's going to happen, okay? Great. Okay. So now um, we've talked about our sensitivity specificity. We can start talking about risk. So we said that odds ratio is a equation that we can use uh, in our case control studies. Now, case control, is that a prospective or a retrospective study? Nice, very good. Case control is going to be retrospective. What's that? 
you know, honestly, Eva, this is something that will, <laughs> they will ask you about this. A simple fact like that, I know it seems obvious and I'm just, you know, peppering you with questions today, but something as simple as that is going to lead you to an answer um, on step one. I guarantee it. I know it seems simple, but these are the things that they need you to know. So case control, this is retrospective. We're looking at charts where we already know that people have a disease and we're going to look at what are the risk factors, right? Um, what are the things that we, that we did and um, did that increase the odds of having a disease? So here what we do is we, um, we draw a chart like this. And again, just like for sensitivity and specificity, I'd like you to draw this chart every time you get the question. Right? Uh, how many lines is this? You just have to go boom, 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 uh, boom, boom, okay, and boom. Now you have the chart, you're ready to go. You put disease on top, and then you write positive, negative, and then you write risk factor on the side, and then you do positive, negative, and then you plug those numbers in. Do it for every single question. I know it seems tedious, but uh, you don't want to miss, this is, these are easy questions to get right, so you don't want to miss them. So what we do here is we take, um, uh, we take these groups and we say the odds of having a disease in the exposed group divided by odds in the unexposed group. Okay. And so, uh, going back to our foot fungus again, foot fungus is going to be our disease and our risk factor is going to be using the gym locker room. Okay. So, uh, someone who uses the gym locker room and has foot fungus is going to be group A. Okay. They have the risk factor and they have the disease. People who use a gym locker room but don't have foot fungus are going to fall into B. They have the risk factor, but they do not have the disease. Okay. Now, there are people who have foot fungus and have never stepped into a gym. Okay. And so someone that's never been to a gym, never used that locker room, uh, is going to fall into group C because they have foot fungus, although they weren't in that locker room. And then D is going to be people without foot fungus, without exposure to a locker room. All right. And so in terms of calculating, we just want to take the odds of having the disease with the risk factor divided by the odds of having the disease without the locker room. OK, and so we're going to take um, the odds, all the people with the disease that were in the locker room divided by people that uh, were in the locker room without the disease. That's going to be our numerator In the denominator. We're going to put people that have the disease never been in a gym locker room divided by people without the disease have never been in a locker room. Okay, we're going to do that. And the answer will be our odds ratio. All right. Now, uh, to make this a little bit um, more digestible, uh, we can actually um, sort of algebra this out. And the number that you actually get is going to be a times d, which is the number with the disease with the risk factor times the number without the disease without the risk factor. And then uh, multiply that by B and C, which is people without the disease and the risk factor um, and people without the risk factor and the disease. OK, and so if you multiply all that out, you're going to come up with the same number as, you know, obviously, you know, leaving it in its normal form. So when you see this equation in your first aid book or wherever, just know that this was derived by, um, you know, doing all the algebra and sort of flipping the reciprocals here. OK. Great. So uh, that is our odds ratio. This is relatively easy to calculate. Um, more often than not, you will not be asked to calculate the odds ratio. Oftentimes, instead, they will give you the numbers in the equation form without um, solving it, right? So your answer choices will be something like 10 times 2 over 6 times 8. Right. And then you have to look back into the question stem and figure out which one is the 10, which one is the two and make sure that everything's in the right spot. OK, so again, talking about equations that you must know, you must know either that this equation or this equation um, and that that is your odds ratio. And when it comes to odds ratio, you know, that's associated with case control. Just think about the words odds ratio. We're going to take the odds of each and put them in a ratio. It's really just that simple. OK, nothing too complicated about it. Moving into our cohort here, we're able to use a stronger mathematical device to calculate a stronger quality number, a number that means more. So in relative risk is the probability of getting a disease in the exposed group versus unexposed. Because we're looking forward, we're able to do this a bit stronger of an equation. So what is our equation? We're going to take people with the disease 
divided by people with the disease plus people with the risk factor but without the disease. Okay, so in our numerator is going to be all people with the risk factor. And if you look at our, our description here, that makes sense. Risk in the exposed group versus unexposed group. Everyone A and B are both exposed to gym locker rooms. So that's the ex exposed group. In our denominator are going to be the unexposed group. Okay, and we're going to uh, basically plug and chug to get our answer. Okay. You really, um, you know, when you say you have to talk it out, I have to tell you, I did the same thing. I don't, I don't know if that's a really a language barrier or what it is for me to really make sure that I'm understanding the question, understanding what they're asking me, understanding the research that they did. I would verbally kind of talk it out to myself, which is a little awkward for all the other people taking a test at the time, but who cares, right? I'm going to get a good score. Uh, so I'm sorry if it's disturbing you, but you know, it helps to actually talk it out. Maybe not at a full volume, but talk it out. That's fine. Relative risk reduction, por proportion of risk reduction attributable to the intervention as compared to control. So we have, we have our relative risk. We calculated it out. We said that um, there is a, uh, say, 30% risk of getting foot fungus if you go into a gym locker room. Okay, that is the uh, probability of getting your foot fungus if you go into that gym locker room okay so how much do we contribute um this uh how much do we contribute this gym locker room to getting foot fungus uh, what we do is we do one minus that relative risk okay and so rather than being relative risk reduction is really used more for when you do an intervention on a patient so, you know, um, say doing a cardiac cath on someone who um, is having a myocardial infarction, how much does that decrease your risk of having long-term heart complications? That's what you use relative risk reduction for. Um, instead of the example we were just talking about where it's more of a risk factor for getting a disease, relative risk reduction is the, um, the amount uh, that you decrease the risk by doing a certain intervention, okay? Uh, I hope that makes sense. Uh, I know it's kind of tied into the example that I was just giving above and it's a little confusing, but um, just know that relative risk reduction is for when we're trying to help a patient. We're doing an intervention to help a patient. Did that help the patient? That's what relative risk reduction is for, okay? Um, and you can see here where it says risk factor or intervention. So uh, the types of questions you can be asked about is um, what is the relative risk um, when you implement, when a patient is uh, exposed to certain things versus uh, you can also do relative risk for when we are making a change in the treatment of a patient, what's the relative risk of them also uh, long-term getting this condition, okay? Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Yes? Okay, okay, good. Okay. So now... Uh, attributable, attributable risk, um, and again, kind of harping again, all of the equations on the previous slide, all of these equations you need to know um, and have memorized for your exam. Uh, I know it seems like a lot. What I did was I had a set of eight um, equations that I would write down every day, sort of towards the end of my study session. I would write them all down from memory as much as I could. And um, I did that for like the last two or three weeks before I took my exam every single day, write those eight equations down, see how much you can get. And every day you're going to be able to remember a little bit more. And that's, that was sort of my passive way of memorizing this stuff because it's not fun memorizing equations. We're not mathematicians. There's a reason we didn't go into engineering because we don't want to do a lot of math equations, but, um, there's a painless way to do it, which is just once a day, uh, you know, towards the end of your study session, write down every single equation you can remember that you're supposed to remember and see how much you can get. Uh, and I promise you after three weeks of doing that, you're going to remember all the equations. Okay, great. So moving on, attributable risk, proportion of cases attributable to one risk factor, um, which is our AR, our attributable risk. Here we're taking uh, the group of people exposed to a certain risk factor. So these are all of our gym locker room people. And we subtract 
the number of people that uh, did not use a gym locker room that have foot fungus, okay? And so, in doing so, here we get our attributable risk. This is how much of the people with foot fungus can we attribute to that uh, gym locker room, okay? Because these things don't ex don't live in a vacuum. How much can we attribute? So uh, this can be helpful. One thing to remember here is we are subtracting one from the other. We are subtracting these proportions. Um, in my experience, I never had to calculate this one out. Typically, the proportions were given to me in the question stem. So they would say, uh, you know, um, uh, there's uh, 0.8 people. Uh, 0.8 is the number proportion of people who get foot fungus and go into a locker room. And then, you know, 0.6 is the number of people with foot fungus that have never been in a gym locker room. And then they would ask, what is the attributable risk? You would need to know that you have to subtract that people who had never been exposed to the risk factor, but have the disease from people who have been exposed and have the disease. Okay, so that's attributable risk. Number needed to harm, number of patients who have to be exposed to a risk factor for one patient to be harmed. How many people need to go into a gym locker room before one person gets a foot fungus? We're going to take that attributable risk, put it in the denominator, and, uh, and put one in the numerator and see what we get. Okay. Absolute risk reduction is the difference in risk attributable to an intervention as compared to a control. Okay, so here again, we are um, talking about interventions rather than talking about uh, risk factors. So it's a little bit different there. Uh, and last is the number of people needed to treat to have one successful treatment. Okay, and so uh, these ones are a little bit trickier. Um, the things, what you really need to do is memorize each of these equations. Uh, and then know the name of them, okay? If you memorize the equation, you know the name of the equation, that's what they're gonna be asking for. They're gonna say, uh, okay, so here's a bunch of numbers. What is the difference in risk attributable to the intervention compared to the control? Okay, well, I know that is my absolute risk reduction, what they just described. I know the equation for absolute risk reduction. Let me draw out my diagram, plug in my numbers, and then I'm gonna come up with my answer, okay? And so um, not all things in biostats or all things that we discussed today are equally as important or equally as high yield for step one. Um, definitely, you have to be super comfortable with sensitivity and specificity. You have to do about 100 of those questions and really know it inside and out. Okay, so that would be number one in terms of what equations you need to know. Specificity, sensitivity. Number two, your PPV, NPV. When do you use them? How do you calculate it? Okay. And now after that, you move into so some of the um, lower yield things. Odds ratio, relative risk. That's going to be number three. You have to know those and when to use them. When do you use it for cohort? When do you use it for case control? Um, so that's number three. Number four is when we start getting into these relative risk and how to calculate that. Uh, number five is all the equations on this page, okay? So this is really, you may have one or two questions about this on your exam compared to the previous five I just told you about. You'll have multiple questions asking you to be able to calculate. I think I probably had four or five questions on my step one exam where I had to calculate sensitivity or specificity. Um, and, uh, you know, you expect to see a lot of crazy ass stuff like this on your exam absolute risk reduction, you know, going into my exam, I'm like, oh my God, I have to know how to do this. This is gonna be such a big part of my exam. You may get one, one question on this idea, okay? You're gonna get a lot of questions on sensitivity and specificity though. So be able to do that without making any mistakes, without making any mistakes. Draw out the chart every single time and be really, really, um, be really confident in your ability to do those questions, that you're gonna put the numbers in the right places and come up with the answer, okay? Because uh, the way that they try and trip you up is they make every combination of those numbers an answer choice, right? Uh, you can't figure it out from the answer choice. They're gonna combine the numbers in every which way to try and confuse you. Be really comfortable in your ability to get to sensitivity and specificity and um, your relative risk, be able to calculate that, and you should be fine, okay, for these equations. All right. And it's scary, you know, especially this slide. It's very scary going into an exam knowing you're going to have to calculate this stuff. But I have to tell you, it's a very small part of your exam. You need to prioritize what you're studying and make sure you are really making the most of your time getting ready for biostats. 
Okay. Great. Now. Good. Yes. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. Um, as you're going through, um, even as you're going through the question stem, as soon as you realize that it's a question that's going to be asking you to calculate any of these equations, draw the chart. Do it as soon as you realize it, start drawing that chart. And plug in those numbers as you go along. Okay. Um, and we're going to do some questions together and practice this because it's very important to apply these ideas and practice them. Unlike other parts of studying for step one where I can guide you through it, we can talk about endocarditis and how that's gonna make a murmur. I can really, you know, we can work together and really, be, I can guide you through it. This one is really just gonna be almost muscle memory. Muscle memory, just doing these questions over and over and over and, uh, and having just a routine that you do. It's kind of like, uh, I don't know if you watch basketball, but in you know basketball players, they practice shooting free throw shots a thousand times a day, right? They'll just sit there at the free throw line and just shoot one after another, one after another. That's how you need to be with these kinds of equation questions. Just just hammer them out, do as many as you can, um, and you're gonna get better at it. Okay, you're gonna get quicker at it. You're gonna get better at it. It's all gonna be muscle memory at the end of the day. So to answer your question, yes, I would agree. It's a good idea to uh, not to look at the answer choices. Uh, until you have, um, you know, your equation kind of teed up and ready to go. Okay. Very good. Great. So for our hypothesis testing, just some defi definitions for you. Uh, our null hypothesis is uh, no relationship between the two measurements. The goal of every research uh, study is to disprove the null hypothesis. We are living in a world where no one knows whether, uh, you know, gym locker rooms and foot fungus are related to each other, right? So our null hypothesis is that there's no relationship between these two. Our goal with this research study is to prove that there is a relationship, okay? But we may make some errors along the way. So a type 1 alpha error is rejecting the null hypothesis when it's true, okay? So we do our research study and we say, you know what? We proved that gym locker rooms cause foot fungus, there is a relationship uh, when in reality, that's not the case. We made a type one error, okay? In reality, gym locker rooms have nothing to do with foot fungus, but somehow we made a mistake in our research and proved that there, there, is, a, uh, there is a connection, okay? Now, there's, we can do another research study and we see, oh my God, there is no connection between a gym locker rooms and foot fungus. Uh, you know, we looked at our data a certain way and this is what we see. But in reality, there is a connection. And so in that case, we made a beta error, type 2 error, accepting the null when it's false. Okay. I think the best example of this is this classic meme where they show a type 1 error and you have a man talking to an elderly man and the man says you're pregnant. Okay. We rejected the null hypothesis here. We, this man, uh, there's no relationship between this man and, uh, you know, baby growing in his belly. We rejected that um, even though that is true, right? It's true that there's no connection between this man and a baby growing in the belly. We rejected it. We made a type 1 error. Type 2 error is we have a very obvious thing staring us in the face, um, which is that this patient is pregnant and we uh, you know, accepted the null hypothesis. We said she's not pregnant. Um, and so that is a beta error, type 2 error. Okay. So our power is the probability of rejecting the null when it's indeed false. It's really a great description for this statistic because that's what it is. It's, it's the study that you've designed. How powerful is it? If there is a connection here, will we be able to see it? How do we do that? We have to increase the sample size. Okay. And so, you know, when we did our first study that had 10 people and we saw seven of them had foot fungus, um, that's one thing. But to do a study with a thousand people and look at foot fungus, that's much that we'll be able to see much more, um, you know, connections and relationships with a larger group of people. So a uh, question uh, that you will commonly see is how to increase the power of your research, increase the sample size. By increasing the sample size, we have a greater probability of rejecting that null hypothesis. Okay. 
great. If we were to uh, diagram this, uh, diagram this on a chart, what would we see? So here we have our null hypothesis, and here we have our alternative hypothesis. Our mean is going to be here, um, and uh, our type one error and type our type one error and type two errors are going to fall in these areas. Okay, and so. Here's our null hypothesis. You can see that this is the trend line for that null hypothesis. If we were to accept that this is true, this little red shaded area, would that be a type one error or type two error? Exactly. Yes. So the null hypothesis is that there's no connection. I'll, mm -hmm. So, beca yes. So because we are accepting this on this side, this is the alpha error. Very good. Uh, type two error would be on the other side of the mean. Um, if we accept the null when it's actually false. Yep. Very good. Very good. Um, Yay. <laughs> yes, you can biostats now. Congratulations. You have the power of biostats. <laughs> All right, so standard deviations. This one just kind of comes down to memorization. Um, you have to memorize that 68% is within one standard deviation. Okay, so here's our mean. Uh, we have 34% to one side of the mean, 34% on the other side of the mean. Okay. So that's one standard deviation. Two standard deviations is going to be 95%. Well, oh, I can't draw. Hello? Okay, so great. So 95% is going to be two standard deviations. 99.7% is going to be three standard deviations. Okay? And so everything that's left over is going to be uh, 0.15 uh, on one side of the mean and 0.15 on the other side. Okay? And then that, that's sort of all that's remaining is just that 0.15. Okay, questions on standard deviation? Very straightforward. Okay, great. Okay. So, uh, biases, right, we have to kind of uh, learn what are the different types of biases. We, you will be asked about it. Typically, they will, you know, describe a study and ask you what the bias is. Uh, so, you know, the most easy and straightforward, I think, is the selection bias. Here we have non-random assignment of subjects. Um, and so, obviously, the problem with the selection bias is it's not going to be a true representation of your population, whatever it is, if you're not randomly assigning the subjects, okay? And so this one is frequently asked about. Uh, sampling bias here, we have subjects not representative of the population. And so if we say sent out a, um, a postcard and, um, and the postcard said we're looking for people uh, to be in this research study and we are offering, um, you know, a free bottle of whiskey if you take part in this study. Okay, so people that respond to that study are only going to be people that drink whiskey. Right, so the study that you do, it's not gonna be re representative of the entire population because if you're not a whiskey drinker or you don't drink alcohol at all, why would you respond to that study, okay? So you're now your research study is really just gonna be focusing on people that drink alcohol. And so um, this is a sampling bias. The sample that you took is not representative of the rest of the population, okay? Great. The difference between selection and sampling bias, the way that I think about this is, where is it coming from? So in a sampling bias, you have your subjects uh, responding to a research study uh, somehow, or um, subjects are being enrolled in a way that's not representative of the population, versus selection bias, it's, it's more from the researcher's point of view. So the researcher is moving patients in a, in a way that's not random. Anytime it's not random, that's a selection bias, okay? That's sort of the big difference between those two. Now, uh, your recall bias 
This is for retrospective studies where we are asking patients, okay, we're doing a research study to look at whether or not aspirin affects, um, you know, um, the rates of ADHD if the mother had aspirin while she was pregnant, okay? And so we're going to go to all these moms of kids with ADHD and we're going to say, okay, when you were pregnant, did you take any aspirin? Okay, nine months is a long time. Uh, and especially when you're trying to remember a nine month period of time when your child is already old enough to be diagnosed with ADHD. So this could be six, seven years ago. People are not gonna really remember or be able to confidently answer that. And so recall bias is um, a patient generated bias where uh, we are asking information that can be um, fudged, okay? Um, knowledge of the disorder can uh, affect the can alter the recall. So you have mothers, they know their co their kid has ADHD and they're going to say, oh, yeah, you know what? I probably did have aspirin. My kid has ADHD. So, you know, maybe that's why, right? Now we're making assumptions about it. And that really is not going to be a good research study. Late look bias is when you have data gathered at an inappropriate time. Lead time bias is early detection confused with uh, increased survival, okay? And so the classic example of this that you may be given is for pancreatic cancer, okay? Pancreatic cancer is a cancer that is very deadly. We do not have a good treatment for pancreatic cancer. Typically, people that get pancreatic cancer are going to die, okay? Now, if we have, so the way that we detect it now is when a patient starts to feel some abdominal discomfort, they come in to see their doctor, okay? And so this is the patient's life. Uh, here is their death, right? Uh, they come in to see their doctor here when they're having abdominal symptoms, okay? Doc, I'm feeling sick. Uh, it's not great. And then so we discover the patient has pancreatic cancer. They live for another three years and then they unfortunately pass away, all right? So um, what if we had a test that we tested everyone at a certain age if they have pancreatic t cancer, all right? So it's called the pancreatic cancer test, the PCT. Uh, and so we're gonna give this patient their PCT test at age you know, 25, and guess what? We discover that they have pancreatic cancer. Oh no, not great. And now we follow them over their entire life, and then they ultimately expire, okay? So now we have early detection of this pancreatic cancer. Uh, and now this patient was able to live for another, say, 30 years, right? When otherwise they would have only lived about five years. Is there a difference in survival here? Did this patient actually live longer? No, they did not. Very good. Um, because just because you detect something, if we don't have a good treatment for it, it's not really going to make a difference, right? And so uh, lead time bias, uh, typically you're going to be asked about some very deadly condition, okay? So think, um, I don't know, breast cancer, uh, prostate cancer, colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, you know, these, these, these tumors that take a lot of lives and take a long time to develop. It's great if you can detect it early, but if you can't do anything about it, what's the point, okay? Now, something like uh, colonoscopies, it's the opposite. If we do a colonoscopy and we see a uh, polyp growing, we can take that polyp out and prevent the uh, progression to cancer. So in that case, we do have an increased survival because of that early detection, okay? So that's sort of the two differences. Your lead time bias is when you're, you're not really doing anything differently, okay? Great. Uh, confounding bias, a factor is related to both exposure and outcome, but not on the causal pathway. So the classic example here is that um, you take patients who, uh, let's say whiskey drinkers again, okay? And we look at rates of lung cancer in whiskey drinkers. And what we see is that uh, patients who drink whiskey are about five times more likely to have a certain type of lung cancer, squamous cell lung cancer, than patients that do not drink whiskey, okay? Oh my God, we have our government that gets involved. They say no more whiskey for the entire population, all right? And now we do a research study a few years later and see that the rates haven't changed. What happened? Well, uh, turns out patients that drink whiskey also smoke cigarettes, okay? So there's a factor that's related to the exposure, which is whiskey, and the outcome, which is lung cancer, that wasn't on our causal pathway of our alternative hypothesis, okay? And so in that case, we would have a confounding bias. Our results were confounded by something that we weren't controlling for, okay? Uh, and uh, that example of 
of, uh, you know, people that go to the bar uh, who are also smoking cigarettes is, is really very much the classic example of a confounding bias that you may see on your exam. Okay. Uh, procedure bias subjects in different groups are not treated the same. Um, and so that one's pretty obvious. Attrition bias is where you have a large number of people drop out of a certain, um, you know, you have your experimental group and your control group. If you have a large number of people that drop out of one of those groups, that's called attrition, and that's gonna affect your, your results, right? If you have a bunch of people that dropped out or that died um, and you didn't count them in your final calculation, that's uh, called an attrition bias and it's gonna affect your results, okay? I'm not sure why it's not written here. Uh, does that make sense, attrition bias? Okay. I, I got to get on this guy who makes my slides. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Very good. Okay, and so there's really just three statistical tools or uh, tools that we use um, that we need to know of. First is going to be our chi-squared. Chi-squared is used for comparing percentages or fractions. Percentages or fractions, okay? So honestly, the way I remember chi-squared, whenever we're comparing things that are not means, okay? So if they've given you something else to compare besides a mean, go for your chi-squared, okay? Uh, T-test is very simple. A T stands for two. So whenever you have two means, you use a T-test. Do not make it any more complicated than it needs to be. If they've given you just two groups with two means, use a T-test. All right, uh, ANOVA is for if you have three groups with three means or four groups with four means or five groups with five means, any, any number of means over two, you're gonna use the ANOVA, okay? It's really just as simple as that. Uh, you will see questions that ask you which of the following um, uh, statistical tools will we need to use for this study? Uh, and so these are the ones that you really need to know. There are more, um, but you don't really need to know them. These are the important ones. Okay, very, very straightforward. Great, so now is my favorite part. We can actually start to talk about, uh, start to do some practice questions, okay? And so our first practice question here is an assignment type practice question. So obviously not something that you would see on step one, but uh, makes it easy for us to talk about another concept in biostats. So a study wishes to assess birth characteristics in a population. Which of the following variables describes the appropriate measurement scale or type? Okay. And so we have continuous measurements, ordinal measurements, nominal measurements, or dichotomous measurements. Okay. And so Birth weight in grams. If we measured all of our um, baby's birth weight in grams, would that be a continuous, ordinal, uh, nominal, or dichotomous? Okay, so let's put a pin in that one. Uh, birth weight classified as low, medium, or high. Well, this one, so let's put a pin in this one. Uh, yeah, good. So on C, we have as low or not low. That's okay. And then for D, delivery type as cesarean, natural, or induced. So here, uh, these these all these all kind of get blurry. That's okay. No, no, don't never say sorry. No, never say sorry. Uh, we haven't gone over this yet. Why would you be sorry? Uh, so birth weight in grams. There is no uh, ultimate number, right? We start at zero and it goes to infinity. Okay. So it's continuous. Very good. Now for. Uh, so continuous, this is, this is the very easy one. Now the next three we have to kind of go through. Dichotomous, well that die means two, um, which, which you were absolutely right about. And so when we have birth weight classified as low or not low, that would definitely fall within there. So now we're stuck with ordinal or nominal, okay? So the way that you have to remember this is order, ordinal can be placed in order, okay? Nominal, it can only be categorized by name. Think nom like name, okay? And so when it comes to cesarean, natural, induced, what order would you put those in? 
You can't, right? You can't put natural before cesarean induced after. Good. Good. So this would be nominal. Right. Right. Absolutely. So things like colors, categories, um, all of those things can't really be put in order. Um, and so those would always be a nominal type of characteristic. And then ordinal would be categories, but things you can put in order. Okay. So this would be our B. Okay. Very good. Okay. So next, uh, we have a question here. In an experimental study, patients with advanced breast cancer are treated with a new drug. After three years of follow-up, radiographic scans are used to determine the number of metastatic lesions from each study patient. The number of METs for each patient is shown in the figure. Based on these data, which is the average number of metastatic lesions for patients treated with the new drug? <laughs> What are they asking? Yes. Uh, yeah. So they're asking, what is the mean, really? Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh -huh. Yep. Yep. It takes practice. It takes practice. That's all there is to it. Uh, they didn't say, but they you could probably, uh, adding all, everything together from this diagram, should be able to figure out how many total patients. So, uh, we have... It's okay. No, no, don't worry. Uh, so here we have four different groups, essentially. We have a group of patients with three METs, a group of patients with two METs, a group of patients with one MET, and a group of patients with zero METs. Um, and so uh, for the number of patients in each group, that's what's represented on the y-axis. So in terms of uh, calculating the average, we would look at what is the total number of, uh, of lesions and divide it by what's the total number of patients. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Uh, the way that they set this question up makes it a little trickier. But really, all you need to do is, um, is calculate how many total METs are there. So we have 10 patients in the three MET group, right? So how many METs would that be? We have 10 patients in the three MET group. So total would be 30, right? Great. No, nope, no problem. Don't say sorry. Um, so that's 30. Uh, and then in the two MET group, it's going to be 20. Good. In the one MET group, 30 METs. And uh, no, and number of METs in the zero MET is obviously going to be zero. Okay. So that's going to be our numerator. In the denominator, we want all of the patients. Okay. And so we can add those first three again. We have 30, 20, 30, and 50. Mm-hmm. <laughs> plus zero because yeah that's that's okay uh-huh Mm hmm yep. 
130. Okay, good. So without needing to calculate all that out, what would you put for your answer here? That's okay. Uh, well, if we were to calculate this 80 over 130, this would be something like 0.6, maybe 0.7, something like that. And so the average number uh, would just be between zero and one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if we had, a, if instead this uh, diagram showed um, only 10 patients uh, with zero METs, and maybe 50 patients with three Mets, obviously the number would be a lot different, right? Um, instead of having 30 up here, we would have something like 150. And so that would be a much larger number when we calculated it out. Excellent, yes. No, no problem. Mm-hmm. 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 That's okay. I think the biggest thing, uh, honestly, is just going to be practice and doing these questions over and over again because it's very easy to be bewildered and like a deer in the headlights, you know, when you see a question like this. Um, when I first looked at this question, I'm like, how the heck am I supposed to calculate that? It doesn't make sense. Um, so I definitely, uh, you know, Understand, um, you know, when they're throwing all this stuff at you, what exactly am I supposed to do? Um, but uh, when it comes to things like average, mean, you're comfortable with calculating a mean. And so you need to figure out how, the next step would be how to calculate a mean. So on this one, we would have, you know, the only way to really do it is to look at the total number of METs. And so if you have 10 patients with three METs, you know, that's what you would do. But obviously the question is not going to be exactly the same. You'll need a different approach on your step one. But, uh, you know, don't, don't um, you know, don't, don't be scared. Uh, you know, when you, when you get to your question, you know what average is. Figure out how to get an average from what they're giving you here. Okay? Great. So let's do some more practice. So here we have a large study of serum cholesterol levels in patients with diabetes reveals that the parameter is normally distributed with a mean of 230, standard deviation of 10. According to these results, 95% of serum cholesterol observations in these patients lie between which of the following limits? And then we have a bunch of different uh, you know, levels of cholesterol. Normally distributed just means it's got the, yep, that's all that means. Yep, very good. Yep, very good. So 230 is going to be the mean. That's, that should be the apex of our bell curve. Uh, the standard deviation is 10, which means every time we move 10 away, we've moved one standard deviation. So, yep, so this would be 240. As we move uh, one standard deviation away, two standard deviations away would be 250. Uh, three standard deviations away would be 260. Okay. And then if we, same thing going in the other direction, we can have 220. Uh, and then 210. Okay. After that, we can have 200. Okay. So great. So those are uh, going to be three standard deviations in either direction. So we want 95% captured. One standard deviation you told me before is 68, great. Two standard deviations is going to be 
95. So, yes. Yep. 210 and 250. Very good. Um, and that just comes down again. That's why I mentioned earlier, you must memorize what is one standard deviation, two standard deviation, three standard deviation. Um, so uh, what would, if they asked us for three standard deviations, what percentage would that be of all of our patients? So what percentage is three standard deviations? Yes, very good, 99.7 percent and so on either side of the bell curve the only that amount that's remaining is going to be our 0.3 divided by 2 which is going to be our 0.15 okay if uh they so they asked us about our 95 percent deviation so the only part remaining outside the bell curve is going to be a total of five percent and so if you just wanted one side of the bell curve it would be that five percent divided by two which would be 2.5 percent on either side Okay. Very good. Very good. Very, very good. Okay. So next we have a uh, investigator uh, suspects that Tylenol use during the first trimester of pregnancy can cause neural tube defects. She estimates the risk of NT defects in the general population is 1 in 1,000. Which of the following is the best study designed to investigate the hypothesis? Yeah, good, good, very good. Yes, yep, yep, you want, uh, you know, looking back in the past is not the best study design. You can do it that way, but what happens when you ask a mom whose baby has neural tube defects if she used Tylenol? She's probably going to say yes, right? So it's probably not a good idea to do that case control. Clinical trial, um, you know, this is going to be not a good idea. Right, because you may induce neural tube defects in otherwise healthy babies. Not good. Ecologic study is never going to be your right answer. Don't worry about that one. And cross sectional study really just tells us the prevalence of neural tube defects. Okay, so that won't be right either. Very good. Okay, so this I think is um, my coup de gras question. This is probably the most difficult question um, that I will ask you over our 10 weeks together, which is today is the last day. So this is really the toughest one. Let's go through it together. Uh, we have a uh, officials at a large community hospital report increased incidence of ALL among children aged five to 12. Okay. They point out that some households in the community are exposed to chemical waste from a nearby factory. They believe that chemical waste causes leukemia. If a study designed to evaluate the hospital officials claim, which of the following subjects are most likely to comprise the control group? Children exposed to the chemical waste who do not suffer from ALL. Children not exposed to chemical waste who do not suffer from ALL. Children from the hospital's outpatient clinic who do not suffer from ALL. Children not exposed to the chemical waste who suffer from ALL. And E, children who suffer from ALL but got cured. Yes. Mm hmm. So you you were going strong there at the start of your answer, but uh, but then towards the end, mm -hmm. here's so here's here's the way that we're gonna think about this. Okay. Uh, what kind of study would you do for this? Probably a cohort study might take a long time. So case control is fine, right? We're going to do a case control study. We're going to look at the odds ratio. Um, and, uh, that's great. So in terms of calculating odds ratio, we need to make a chart, right? That's the first thing that we do. So let's make this chart. Okay. Beautiful. And on top, we are going to have the disease, which is our ALL. Here's our ALL positive people, ALL negative people, okay? On the y-axis, we're gonna have our risk factor, which is the uh, chemical waste, right? So this is positive exposed 
negative exposed. Okay, and we're gonna write in A, B, C, D. We, then they give us all of our numbers. We're gonna plug it in. When we make our equation, the groups that we're comparing is the odds of having ALL in people that are exposed, right? So that's gonna be our, the, our numerator. And our denominator is the odds of having ALL in people that are not exposed. Okay? So, when you look at this part of the equation, this is what's being asked about. What is this part of the equation? This part of the equation is, is looking at patients with LLL who are not exposed to that chemical. That's how you compare it. Mm hmm. Very good. Very good. Yes, very good. Um, and so that is that is um, how you got to think about it. Uh, how are we going to do this study? And what should the groups comprise? When I first did this question, Eva, I answered the same thing that kind of made the most sense to me. But uh, when you start to think about okay, how are we actually even going to do this research? What equation are we going to use? There's no equation in biostats that involves people without a disease, without any exposure, being the primary group, okay? We wanna make sure that the exposure is the thing that matters, so let's look at people with the disease without the exposure and prove that that exposure is what's doing it, okay? Very good, very good. Any questions on this? <laughs> practice makes perfect good yeah good yeah definitely your english is very good your english is very good okay next we have 500 women aged 40 to 54 who present for routine checkups asked about their meat consumption 20 percent of them turn out to be vegetarian during the next five years Five vegetarians and 43 non-vegetarians develop colorectal cancer. Which of the following describes the best study design? <laughs> yep. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you're looking into the future, which one is it? Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, you nailed it, yeah. <laughs> I know, you were about to. Uh, <laughs> that's why I wasn't going to let you complicate it. <laughs> I was not going to let you uh, make it more complicated than it has to be. You're looking into the future. You started a study, you asked at the beginning, and then you measured a risk um, uh, disease progression over over time. And so that's that's what it is. So just for the fun of it, because you know I love having fun and during these sessions. Let's just fill out this chart, okay? So do you have a pen and paper in front of you? <laughs> yes, please, please, please tell them how terrible I am. Um, uh, do, do you have a pen and paper in front of you? Okay, so, sure, sure, absolutely. So, um, uh, just let me know when you finish um, and then uh, I'll, fill, I'll fill mine out. If you'd like to do it that way, that's the way I always do it and I keep it the same so I don't get confused. Um, but it's perfectly fine to do the risk factor on top um, instead, just as long as you do it the same way every single time. Okay. 
Wonderful. Okay. So you didn't fill everything. I want to see everything. Well, I guess you don't have to show me everything, but you'd have to tell me. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. If we were, if instead this question asked you, um, you know, we did something to a patient with a disease um, and we took this group when we did that thing to them and this group, we didn't do that thing to them. Instead, you would put intervention on the Y axis. But if it's something like this, where we're just talking about exposure, just leave risk factor there. Risk factor, AKA exposure, whatever. Okay. In this type of study, it's really about who was eating vegetables. All right. Uh, so here we're no problem. So let's, let's start from the beginning here. So risk factor positive and negative. Uh, how many people are vegetarian? Mm -hmm. 20%. So what, how many, how many is that? A hundred. Good. So, um, the way that I would set this up, uh, this quit, this question is to say that the risk factor is consuming meat. Okay. So I would say that there is 400 people who were exposed to that risk factor and then 100 people who were not exposed to that risk factor. Okay. So that's step one. Now we can look at these other numbers they threw at us. So over the ensuing five years, five vegetarians and four, so five vegetarians develop colorectal cancer. So let's go here to our vegetarians, not exposed, and look at our disease. So positive for disease, negative for risk factor would be five. Okay. And then, so what would go here in our D spot? Right, this is A, B, C, D. This is how we're going to do all of our um, relative risk and all that kind of stuff. We're going to use these numbers. Absolutely. So what goes in this D position? What number? Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh yeah. Wonderful. Yep. Very good. Very good. Okay. And then so for A would be what number? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Yes. 43. Very good. Okay. And so this would be 357. Very good. So now that we have all these numbers plugged, we can easily would you want to do odds ratio or relative risk in this case? <laughs> I know I'm really, this question didn't ask any of this stuff. I'm making this question the worst question ever. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yes, exactly. This. So we said that we are doing a cohort study. We're looking. 
You did. Yes. Yeah, very good. No problem. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, you're right. Relative risk. And so I don't want you to plug all this number into a calculator, but if you can just give me a general idea of what you would like in the numerator and the denominator, and then I promise we'll move on from this question. <laughs> <laughs> so before you look up the formula don't look at the formula relative risk is the risk in people exposed exposed to get the disease versus unexposed okay so before you look at the formula just let's let i mean we have a nice chart here full of numbers let's just think if we wanted to calculate the risk in the exposed we would mm-hmm Very good. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the risk in that group would be people who are positive over all the people in the group. So that would be A plus B. Okay. Unexposed. Same story. C over C plus D. Okay. See, you don't need, you don't need equations. You don't need memorization. Really just thinking about what are we trying to get to with relative risk? We're going to look at the risk in one over the risk in the other. Just that simple. Okay. And so you can plug all those numbers in because we, we wrote A, B, C, D in our chart and that makes it easy. So as you are practicing these questions, I recommend writing A, B, C, D in each of these boxes and so that you remember it. But as you get closer to step one, you may not want to spend so much time making these beautiful charts. Okay. You may just want to quickly scratch it out on your sheet so you can move to the next question. Uh, but again, Muscle memory, uh, practice, practice, practice is going to be your key to success here. Okay. Okay. So I think we have time. Do you have time for one more question? Uh, yeah, we're at, we're at 2.30 now. But uh, I know it flew by. Flew by. Um, so we have time for another question. This is another uh, question asking you the type of study. I don't think that's as helpful. Um let me find one that would be more helpful. Uh, I don't even follow up. Okay, sorry. Okay. Okay, great. This one is perfect. This one is perfect. They do. Yes. Oh my goodness, they do. Okay. So in this one, I'm going to go straight to the question at the bottom first, because I say I'm towards the end of a block. I'm really running out of time. So I'm going to skip ahead. And it says, what is the odds ratio that a patient diagnosed with pancreatic cancer is a current smoker compared to a patient without pancreatic cancer? I look at my answer choices. I see a bunch of numbers over numbers. Great. It's a mess. Good. Yes. So I would come in here before I put my ABCD though. I need to make sure it's set up in the way that helps me, right? Because I don't know if the exposure is on top or um, it's the disease on top. Confirm that first. And I cannot stress this enough. Um, that is an easy way to lose points and it's an easy way to get points. Always, if they give you a chart, that's their chance to really screw with you. That's their chance to just, you know, take their thumb and, and put it in your eye is to flip the chart around so it's not in the way that you're used to. So before you do anything else. Look at this chart and make sure. Okay, so we have pancreatic cancer on top and then we have smoker and non-smoker on the side. I like how this chart is oriented. I have my disease on top and I have my uh, risk factor or my exposure, whatever you want to call it, on the side. I'm comfortable with this. Now that I know that it's, that it's set up in the way that I like, I'm going to write everything in. Okay, A, B, C, D. Okay, so all that's left at this point is... Um, is knowing how to calculate odds ratio. Okay. Which I don't know. I must, I don't, I guess I don't think I got that much sleep last night. I forgot how to do odds ratio. Do you remember by any chance? Okay, yes, 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 yes. Mm 
Sure. Well, um, bottom line, we want, again, exposed over unexposed. So definitely our A is going to be here. And because this is odds ratio, I mean, if we really wanted to go back and read this, it says that they were asked about their current smoking status, right? So this is not a prospective, beautiful cohort study. This is case control, or it may even be a um, cross-sectional because we're not following these patients. We're just asking them in, at one point. So I think this is a cross-sectional um, research study. Cross-sectional, not a good study. <clears throat> we can't get strong statistics out of it. That's why we do odds ratio. Odds ratio, all we do is take our A and divide it by B. Not a strong number, not a number that um, you know we can really get published in a journal with, right? But whatever, at least we're getting um, some research done. So on the denominator, we're gonna do C divided by D. And we said that this, this is a little bit clunky, so you may end up seeing something like A, D over uh, B, C, you know, to sort of algebra everything out. So in my answer choices, I'm looking for something like this. But at the end of the day, what I wanna see is my A, which is 50, over my B, which is 60, all of that over uh, C, which is 40, over 80. Okay, excellent. And so going now to my answer choices, I can see that my answer D is gonna fit the bill there. Yep, great. And, um, you know. Yeah, they could, do, they could really give you either. Um, and I'm tempted to actually change this question uh, to make it the other way, just to kind of like uh, confuse future students. Um, <laughs> uh, well, let's see. <laughs> okay, so um, you have this uh, PowerPoint. You know that there's other questions in here. Highly recommend doing those questions. And if you, if you have questions on the questions, please uh, reach out to me.